We're in Romans 5, and we're looking at the comparison between Christ and Adam. And that Adam is the lesser of the two. And Paul's trying to make a point about this. We need to see this, that Adam is the lesser of the two. Both did one act that affected all of mankind, but Christ is the greater act. The church... Unfortunately, the church at large, the organized church, has very much exalted the work of Adam above the work of Christ. Okay, Meaning, we've exalted sin and the curse and the effects of sin and the curse and talked about that and made it seem like Jesus is just this plan B to try to tackle this great and horrible mass of Adam's mistake. Right, But in reality, Jesus was plan A. Jesus and the coming of Christ is what history was all about. And Adam and the curse is just a little blip in human history that even brought about more of the fullness of God's glory. So it says right here in, in Romans 5 verse 14, it says, Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not sin by breaking a command. Um, <clears throat> as did Adam, Okay, let me say that before I say this last line. Let me break this down. Okay, it's saying, Nevertheless, death did reign over mankind, even over those who didn't do the same thing as Adam. Sin had an effect over all of mankind, as one act did, um, even those who didn't sin according to the way Adam did. And then it says this very interesting line about Adam, that he was a pattern or a type of the one to come. All right, that word pattern in the original language here is a very strong word. It's talking about um, like a foreshadowing or a parable or a type of the one to come. Who is the one to come? Jesus. Jesus is the one to come. He was the one to come. Adam was only a type. He was only a foreshadow of Jesus Christ. So if Adam was a foreshadow, was a type, all right, meaning kind of, we, we've talked about this many times, a type or a shadow, kind of a lesser picture pointing to the greater picture. If he was a type or shadow of the one to come, then we know the whole story surrounding him in the Garden of Eden was a type or a shadow of what was to come. Okay, This is not to say that Adam wasn't a real person. Okay, Adam was a real person. Even geneticists will tell you that the mitochondria in our DNA all comes from one mother. They've just, they have realized that we all come from one seed. Every homo sapien, black, yellow, white, doesn't matter, all come from one mother. Okay. So anyway, Adam's real. I believe the story's real. I think some of it can be somewhat poetic. Okay. I don't, I don't know if it was a literal uh, morning and night, six day kind of thing. Okay. But you know what? I don't worry about that. I really don't. Some people will argue tooth and nail and they won't even talk about Jesus. They'll just argue about the literal six day creation. And, um, you know, I found Jesus through an evolutionary Christian. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't really believe in that as much anymore because I've really seen a lot of the lies and natural selection and Darwinism. But I actually came to Jesus through somebody who believed in Anyway, I'm getting way off track here. All I want to say is that I affirm in the Bible, I believe it's truth, it's inherent, but it is still, the Old Testament, particularly this story, is still a prophetic picture pointing us to the greater picture of Christ. Adam is a type of who would come. Adam did this one act on a tree that affected all of mankind. Jesus Christ did one act on a tree that affected all of mankind. And that's the greater picture. That's the reality. That's the thing we need to focus on and realize. And this story in Genesis is simply a, uh, a, a little foreshadowing of that. Okay? So, I so just when you say, say the tree, is that the cross? Yeah, I'm talking about the... Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. Um, Peter calls him, says that he bore our sins on the tree. Okay. Because what did they use to make the cross, right? Yeah. It was a tree. Okay. So, Understood. wood from a tree. Okay, so go to Genesis 1, and I want to show you something very interesting that the Lord highlighted to me in uh, uh, about, about two, three months ago. All right, Genesis chapter 1. I want to look at the third day of creation. In verse 9, okay, this is talking about the third day. Now, what should the third day make you think of? 
Jesus rising. Yeah. Jesus rising on the third day. He rose from the dead. Okay, and that number three shows up all throughout the Old Testament, even in the prophet Hosea. He says that on the third day, Israel, we would rise with him. Like it's it's all talking about the third day. Okay, so there is meaning, there's substance in this that we need to unpack a little bit. So this is the third day. Verse nine. Then God said, Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and he gathered the waters he called seas, and he saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plant life, plants yielding seed and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind and God saw that it was good so on the third day of creation life happened right this was the first springing forth of life okay the heavens were framed light water land mass okay all of that was created but it was on the third day that life came forth. We weren't there yet, but life and our source of life, our substance of life, came forth. Well, the Lord led me to Genesis 2, and he showed me something very interesting that, that kind of you know, made me look a few times back and forth between the chapters to try and figure out what was going on. Go to the next chapter, in verse 4. Moses who we believe is the writer of Genesis, is is retelling the story of creation here. He tells it again, and it's a little different than the first time. That's why I said, you know, you Where don't have we? to take it so so literally, but this is Genesis 2 now. Okay, 2-4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made heaven and earth. Now, no shrub of the field was yet in the earth. No plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water, and the whole surface of the ground. So the Lord God formed man out of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. We'll stop right there. I was very interested in the fact that it said that the Lord God had made heaven and earth and yet no shrub of the field, no plant life had yet sprouted yet because there was no man yet to cultivate the ground. Okay, if you go back to Genesis 1, it says that God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, planting uh, plants yielding seed and fruit trees and all kinds of life. Let it come forth, and it was so. There was evening and there was morning a third day. It was finished. God said, let there be vegetation. Let there be life. Let there be plant life. Yet, we read in Genesis 2 that when the heavens and the earth were created, and even when man was brought forth, no tree, no shrub, no plant life had yet sprouted. Okay? It hadn't come forth yet. Do you see that connection there? All right? Not anything deep yet. I'm just asking if you see very clearly. He, he spoke plant life into existence, and in the next chapter it says that the plant life hadn't even appeared yet. But yet he had still spoken it into existence. There is a seed on the ground. Well, there you go. Yeah, I believe that. I believe the seed was there. The seed was there. The word was spoken. And it was finished. It was very good. It was a good day. But yet, the manifestation of that word had not come forth yet. Because God said, there's no man yet to cultivate the ground. So, we're going to unpack this a little bit more. This will start to make sense in light of the finished work of Christ. But, to kind of recap a little bit on this message of Christ's finished work, right? On this understanding of the third day. All right? On the third day, Christ rose from the dead and a new creation sprung forth. 
Okay, now before he died, Jesus said some very interesting words. And I think Tom pointed this out in prayer before. Jesus said, it is finished. He said, it's finished. The work is finished. Redemption and salvation has been accomplished. Okay, Jesus said that if a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies and yet remains alone, it won't bear any fruit. But yet if it dies, it will produce a great harvest. Jesus was the seed that united himself with all of mankind, with all of us. And when he went into the ground, when he died, we all died with him. John chapter 12, this is where I'm talking about. I'm not going to read it, but just to explain. Jesus comes and he says, When I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. We need to understand this concept that as Adam, as Adam represented all of us and his act affected all of us, Christ represented all of us and his act affected all of us. There is a unity in man that we don't even fully realize yet. And I really believe scientists are beginning to unpack this with, with crazy quantum physics stuff where they're realizing that we're all connected. We are all connected in a way that goes beyond even the travel of the speed of light. They're finding that there's, there's a connection between particles that, that is faster than the speed of light. There's a union between all of us, okay? So, Jesus, he was in union with all of us, okay? He is God. He is the one through whom whom we have our existence, through whom all things exist, okay? That's so paramount to understand about Christ, okay? His actions affect all of us. We were united with him on the cross, okay? So, he says, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And when Jesus was talking about that grain of wheat, that grain, that seed, dying in the ground, but producing a great harvest, he was talking about his one life, this little seed, that went on to produce this great harvest of resurrection life. And so when Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, new life sprang forth. And we were just talking about Genesis 3. Okay, when God spoke new life, on Genesis 1, on the third day, when God spoke new life into existence. Okay? There was a new creation that burst forth. Jesus was the first fruit. Think of it as the first plant that came forth of a new creation, of a new life. Remember, this is all pointing us, the story of Genesis is a type. It's pointing us to this work of Christ, to the greater picture of God and of his work of redemption. Okay, That there would come a day, on the third day, the, the life of God would spring forth. And he would say, it is finished. He would speak his word of a new creation. And so Christ emerges from the grave on the third day and he announces redemption and reconciliation and new life for all of mankind. Okay? However, we don't yet see that life springing forth, do we? Right? We don't see the life of Christ springing forth all over the world. Right? right. I mean, very often you turn on the news and you can see the exact opposite of that. Okay, well, just because you don't see the fullness of that life springing forth doesn't mean that God has not spoken his word and said, it is finished. It's done. Okay, it is done. There, there, he has spoken the word of new life and redemption over all of the earth. There is really, there is already a new creation. We have interpreted that verse in 2 Corinthians very personally as a church, and that's fine because we are new creations in Christ. But that word in 2 Corinthians 5 is really a corporate word. It's talking about a whole new world. There's a new creation, a new world in Christ. Okay, So Christ, he, his word is that there is a new creation. He is the first fruit of that. Okay, The word of God declares that we are now to enter into his Sabbath rest. Now, on the seventh day, what did God do? He rested. It's the Sabbath, right? Okay? He rested because why? The work was finished. The work was finished. He was done. He was done. The work was finished, and then he rested. And so in Hebrews 4, it tells us to enter into the true Sabbath rest, meaning the work is finished. So, so you, you got, some of you are looking at me like a deer in the headlights, but I'm telling you, <laughs> it's going to start clicking. It's hard to describe some of this sometimes, or sometimes it's just too simple for us. <laughs> you know, um, 
But the work is finished. Salvation is accomplished. Redemption, reconciliation is already accomplished. He announced good news and good tidings. All right, It was an announcement. It wasn't a potential offer. It was an announcement of good news. A new creation. The word was spoken. And when Christ rose from the dead, I want you to hear this, God looked at the earth, and he said, once again, it is very good. Hmm. And he rested. Even though we don't yet see all of that life springing forth on the earth. God still looks and he celebrates a finished work. He still entered into a Sabbath on the resurrection. The Sabbath is really a celebration of a finished work. That's what it is. It's not about taking a day off. Okay, That's a nice <laughs> thing you should do for your life because that's healthy to do. But that was not what it was about. The entering the Sabbath of the Lord is about entering into the realization that the work is finished for all of us. For the earth. It's crazy. It's wild. It's offensive. It's a stumbling block. The gospel is a stumbling block. Because we still want our role, our work in bringing about the kingdom. Well, guess what? You still do get some to do. Okay, we're going to talk about that now because what did God say? He spoke the word, the seed was planted in the ground, the work was finished, but then he said, but there's no man yet to cultivate the ground. So, he brings forth a man, Genesis 2, a man made in his image and likeness to go out and to cultivate the ground, this finished work of life spoken, right? He says, now we need man to go and till the ground and, and cultivate the ground and, and water it and take seeds and replant them and, and bring forth a beautiful habitation, a beautiful garden on the earth. The word is spoken. The earth shall be filled with life. Thus says the Lord, my purposes shall not be thwarted. My will shall be accomplished. However, I want to bring forth man to partner with me in taking my finished work, the finished spoken word, and bringing forth life on the earth. So, God raises up a man made in his own image and likeness. That was Adam. But then Christ <coughs> comes. Christ is the one this was all about. Christ is the express image of the invisible God. He is the perfect image and likeness of God. He is the image and likeness restored. Okay? So Christ comes to cultivate the earth, right? To go out and cultivate the earth. But then, then, then God says it's not good that man should be alone. So he puts man, remember this is a parable, a type of what was to come. He puts Adam into a deep sleep and he cuts him open and out of his side comes forth a bride. Well, Jesus Christ was put into a deep sleep. Now, that's, that's the parable. In reality, Christ was put into death. And out of his torn side came forth the church, came forth a bride. We came out of him because he died. We emerged. We emerged out of his death. We came forth. And now we are his bride, his helper, his partner in cultivating the finished work of God on the earth. This is nuts, guys. Yeah. <laughs> this is really nuts. I don't know what to do with this stuff sometimes. I'm like, Lord, what do you do with this? And sometimes he says, you do nothing. You just talk about it. It's scripture unless the seed goes in the ground. Yeah. Right. Sort of the same. See, re see, religion interprets that verse like you need to go and die to all your desires and all your sin, and you need oh. to go and beat yourself up, and if you die, then there will be new life for you. Really, listen, there's principles in that. You learn how to let go of things, you, you will find your life. You know, okay, I know that, but we, we need to major on the majors and minor on the minors. He was preaching about his death right there. It's right before his death. He said that in Jerusalem. He said, because the Greeks wanted to come see him. You know, they said, sir, we would see Jesus. Everybody remember that in John? John chapter 12, the Greeks wanted to see him. And he said, no, not now. He said, I need to die. That's really what he's saying right there. I could go and minister to all these people. I could go and like heal all these people. But unless a grain of wheat falls in the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies in the ground, then I will multiply my life all around. That's what John 12 is about. That's it. That's it. You like it because your spirit recognizes it's the truth. It's the truth. 
I know. How do I die? And you're just and it gives you all these lists of like works, th- things yeah. works that you need to do to beat yourself up. No, it's about Christ's death mm-hmm. on your behalf. Mm-hmm. And we now get to celebrate and to awaken to this reality. So God spoke the word and it was finished. He entered into his rest. <clears throat> But yet no plant, no life had yet totally sprung from the ground. There was a first fruit who is Christ ultimately. There was Adam. And from Adam came forth a bride. And Adam and his bride went and cultivated the earth. And that was their purpose. And God said, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Well, it's the same thing Jesus then said to his disciples. He didn't say, be fruitful and multiply. He said, go out therefore and make disciples of all nations. But it's the same call. That is what Genesis was pointing to. Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 was pointing to this moment in time. It was a type of a time that would come when the real Adam, the, real, the last Adam, the real man, the real God in the flesh would come. He would emerge from the ground and he would go and he would say, now go therefore and be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with the kingdom of God because it's already here the kingdom is within you the work is finished I have already accomplished forgiveness I've already accomplished redemption I have already destroyed death I have the keys of hell and death they're mine now the power's broken it is good news I've defeated death and I've proved it in my resurrection now go there is a seed dormant in every single person so quit beating yourself up well that's one part of it yes it is (laughs) When you say there's a seed dormant, you mean even the unsaved? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to continue in that thought. So, there is a seed of Christ in you, this message of Christ. Paul said in Colossians 1, he said, "It it, It is my call, my purpose, to proclaim among the Gentiles, he says, Colossians 1, 26 through 28, among the Gentiles this great mystery, which is Christ in you. There is a seed, again, that lies dormant in every single person on planet Earth of Christ in them. Now, what is salvation? What is the born-again experience? Okay, all of that kind of stuff. That is simply an awakening to the truth. And the Holy Spirit, they're like, well, what about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit comes to confirm to your spirit that you are a child of God already. It says in Galatians 4 that because we are sons, Christ sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. Every person you see is a child of God. Do not let yourself be fooled into a misinterpretation of John, uh, first, the letter of 1 John to say that there's children of the devil and there's children of God. Children of the devil are people who are deceived. They're, childs of de- they're children of deception. They are still the offspring of God. Every person is a child of God. Every person. And the seed of the truth lay dormant in every single person. And our job is to go and to awaken people, to preach the good news, to awaken that seed, to cultivate it. To cultivate the ground that is already sanctified. Planet Earth is already redeemed. The work, this is what it means, the work is finished. So the reason I'm going to be talking about this in the summer is because I want to totally reformat our whole understanding of ministry. Because we've been taking a Sabbath as a church. We've been really resting and, and, and chilling. But I believe there's a lot of work to do in the future. But in order for us to do work as a church, to go out without stress and without striving and work performance work, we need to, we need to re-understand ministry and what it's all about. That ministry is a privilege and a joy. And it's, it's amazing. It's not this burden. Now you're going to go out and you're going to have to cut through some 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 thorns. <laughs> you know, there's going to be there's going to be pain in ministry, there's pain in life, there's trials and everything, but I'm telling you the the true flavor of ministry is joy and it's peace and it's a privilege and it's a confidence knowing that the work is already finished. I really believe this is what Paul understood that the church doesn't totally understand today. We really are trying to reaccomplish something that God already accomplished. And so when Paul said, I want to come to you in Rome, because he had never been to Rome when he wrote the letter of Romans, okay? But he writes to Romans, and he says, I want to come to you in Rome so that I might have a bunch of fruit by you as well. Mm -hmm. He was so confident that Rome was already included in the death and resurrection of Christ, and he knew that if he went to Rome, he would just get some fruit out of that seed. Mm -hmm. 
by simply preaching the truth to people. Paul says in, in Colossians 1, I think it's 28, I think it's the end of that Christ in you passage, he says we strive to warn and to teach every man, says every man, that they might be perfect in Christ. Complete in Christ. Actually, he says to present or to prove every man perfect in Christ. So he, his point of his teaching, his point of his preaching was to awaken Christ in people. Was to awaken the salvation of God already in people. I pray that if, if anything out of this message, it affects the way you think about people. That when you see a homeless person on the street, you don't see a, a fallen, disgusting drunk. That you see the potential of a king of a child of God who is loved and embraced by Jesus. I mean, really, that's what this leads to. The commandment that Jesus brought forth, the new, the new commandment that I give you is to love. Yes. That comes to mind right now. Yeah. Because that's like, almost takes over um, what we should, how we should go about restoring the kingdom. Yeah. By love. By love. That's perfect. It doesn't it? It really gives new context to what the kingdom is all about, just <coughs> loving people. Yeah. It, it really isn't about us striving and the government being on our shoulders that we need to carry the kingdom, the government, and bring it forth. The kingdom is already here. It's already within. And we get to herald that news by loving people and by speaking the truth of Christ and what he has done for them. Adam comes forth, he breathes the breath of life into Adam. And it says, The Lord God planted a garden towards the east in Eden, and then he placed the man there whom he had formed, and out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. I'm telling you, there is a beautiful tree hidden in every person you see. There is a destiny in that person. There is, there is, even if it's very hidden, even if they are hidden over com a complete muck and mire of lies and deception, there is a seed of destiny and truth in every single person. And love believes all things. Love hopes all things, and love never fails. And in Genesis you read, every tree brings forth fruit of its own kind, and our kind is Jesus. Mm, I like that. <laughs> that. I like that a lot. Because he is the first seed. He is the seed of the new creation, and he will bear the fruit of himself. Yeah. Beautiful. So there is uh, there's a lot more to go into, but I'm going to kind of put the brakes on right now. I mean, really, just let yes, us digest that. Thoughtful, real yeah, it's, it's a <laughs> lot to go into. There's a lot more about how this affects life and ministry and the kingdom and, and uh, all of that kind of stuff. But I really want to leave us with this to understand the, the message of the finished work of the cross it's so much bigger than we realize I have no clue I know I know before God that I have no clue what I'm even preaching how big it is and how much God is going to reveal this in the days ahead okay the, the, the full scope of what God has accomplished the grace of his salvation and the glory that we're going to see is, is just beyond our wildest imagination as we really catch a revelation that it is done it is finished we can rest and we can be confident. Because this brings a new confidence in evangelism. It gives a new peace in eternity. It gives all kinds of stuff. I'm not going to get into that right now. But I just wanted you to see from the scriptures that it is pointing to this greater reality that we're talking about. This isn't just a pop doctrine. This isn't just a fun little thing we're going through for a year. This is all about the kingdom. This is all about what God has done for every single person on this earth. So let's pray. Let's pray and let's just ask the Father to, to expand the knowledge of his truth, to expand uh, that love in his heart, that, that understanding of what he's done through Jesus. Lord, we pray for a greater vision of the cross and a greater vision of the one man, the God-man, Jesus Christ. We pray for a greater vision of, of what he has done and for the victory that he has accomplished, Lord. That it was not a partway victory, a halfway victory, and now the church needs to pick up the other 
it was a complete victory, a complete finished work, and now we get to walk with our bridegroom in the garden, tilling it, enjoying his presence, bringing forth the kingdom on the earth as it is in heaven. Oh, God, reorient our understanding of Christianity, Lord. And I pray, even even though this is months ahead of when I want to release this to the church, I pray that this 9 o'clock service would be like a seed, Lord, uh, a same seed that would begin to multiply in the church, that when we begin to unpack this as a body in the summer and beyond, that, that the church would be ready, that there would be fruit already bearing from it. And that you really would just totally wreck us, God. <laughs> wreck our understanding of Christianity. Father, give us wisdom, God. Give us revelation. Teach us what it really means to be ministers or dispensers of the new covenant. I thank you, Father. Bless us with, with the knowledge of your love, with your glory, God, with your great victory and power. We thank you, Father. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.